Greetings from the Horror Junkie. In our debut tale, a guy battling Charles Bonnet syndrome encounters chilling visions, especially a sinister tall woman who appears in his bedroom. In the follow-up narrative, scientists spot imitators within inmates, monitor their egg-laying behavior, and ponder undercover eradication while pushing forward mimic detection tech. A shocking turn ensues. I've got this thing called Charles Bonnet Syndrome, or you can get all technical and call it visual release hallucinations. It's more common than you might think, especially if your vision's fading. They say as many as half the folks dealing with gradual vision loss will have one or more episodes of this. But I bet most of you folks never heard of it. Why? Cause most of us dealing with this are too scared to talk about what we're seeing. I know I was. But I'm getting ahead of myself here. Name's Andrew, I'm 26. Two years back, I woke up with this awful blurry vision, like someone smeared Vaseline all over a camera lens, couldn't see a thing. I was scared as hell. And I rushed over to Doc Harper's office, had to take a cab, because I couldn't trust myself behind the wheel, even though I'd been driving without a hitch for three years. Doc did some tests, threw some questions at me like, You've been crazy thirsty lately. How often you pee? How's your tiredness levels? Then he hit me with the diagnosis that flipped my whole life. Diabetes. Type 1. He tells me I gotta shoot up with insulin every meal, that if I mess up my diet and don't watch my blood sugar, I could end up in a coma or worse. Then he gets to my eyes. Andrew, your diabetes messed up your eyes, caused maculopathy. You know what that means. I shook my head, still reeling from the diabetes bombshell, and Doc Harper keeps going. It's when your diabetes messes with the blood vessels at the back of your eyes, clogs them up, and makes them leak into the macula, the central part of your retina that lets you see colors and fine details. When that happens, it can mess up your vision real bad. I'm swallowing hard, and I ask, so, what's the fix for this? I can't see Doc's face well, but his tone tells me all I need to know. Sorry. Andrew, he says all serious. Maybe if we caught it sooner, we'd have more options, but it's done some major damage. We can slow it down, but it ain't reversible. My whole world crashes, man. I'm just 24, still in my prime. I'm active, playing ball, cycling, and now my health, my body, and my sight are slipping away. First six months, it's rough. Broke up with my girlfriend, Holly, sweet girl tried to make it work, but I was too damn angry all the time. Lost my job, cause an architect needs his eyes. Even drifted from my friends, stopped seeing them cause of my jealousy cause they got to keep on living while everything I dreamed of got snatched away. I turned into a hermit, holed up in my apartment, not even bothering to shower, shave, or put on proper clothes. I was so sure my life was over, I stopped trying to live it. I was a real jerk. It took me a long time, but eventually, this nurse named Lois, a tall, experienced lady with no nonsense, who was assigned to visit me at home, she's the one who made me realize. She straight up tells me, you're an asshole. I'm like, what? Her choice of words surprised me. She goes on, so you've got diabetes, you know how many people have it? Do you think they all hide away in their apartments, giving up on life just cause their vision's going south? Losing your sight is tough, and I feel for you, Andrew, but it's no excuse to quit. I try to argue, say, but you don't. But she ain't done. Understand, she says, growling. I know a guy who's been paralyzed from the neck down since he was a kid, and he never gave up. You can do way more with your life, 
and you got folks who want to help you, but you can't even be bothered to shave that ugly beard off. Stop being a whiner and make a damn difference. Of course, it didn't change overnight, and I argued with her. I was so mad at her blood talk that I told her to leave. Threatened to report her to her bosses, but she just laughed. You won't, cause you're a smart guy with too much pride, she says. See you next week. That night, I shaved. I opened my curtains, took a real look around. Stuff was blurry, but when I really looked, I could see the mess I'd let my place become. When Lois came back the next week, the place was clean. I was clean-shaven, dressed up, even tried to comb my hair. She didn't say nothing about it, didn't bring up the argument from before, but she took me out for coffee down the street. She guided me along the sidewalk, talked to me, gave me some reassurance. It was scary, even though it was just a short walk, but I felt proud when I got there. Lois and I talked, maybe even laughed a bit. Afterwards, she walked me home, and as she helped me inside, she said, Nice to finally meet you, Andrew. That day marked the start of a new chapter. I moved to a different apartment, one on the ground floor, and joined a crew of other young folks with vision issues. I made some buddies. I got out every day, even if it was just a short walk. I made it a point to see whatever I could of the world. I bought what I could, but the Sawyers, that old couple who ran the local store, they bring my groceries once a week. Clark's a gruff old man, won't coddle me, and he told me he respects me for being who I am, for keeping my independence, for not giving in. Hearing that from a guy like him was one of the nicest things. Things were going good, until a year ago, that is. I walked into my living room with a coffee mug in hand, and there it was, a Victorian funeral carriage right on my rug, with two big, proud horses in fancy outfits, their bridles all decked out with long black plumes. They stood there perfectly still, while the driver, a little bearded guy in old-fashioned clothes and a top hat, fiddled with the reins and stared at me. It was clearer than the usual blurry shapes I saw, and I was about to lose it. I dropped the cup, hot coffee spilling all over my feet, and jumped back, crying out in pain and shock. When I looked back at the horses and the carriage in the room, they were gone. At that moment, I started wondering if I was going crazy. Turns out, a lot of us do, which makes sense. How would you feel if you saw that in your own home? Unless you're Jack the Ripper, I bet you don't have a coach and horses just lying around. I sure didn't. After some quiet swearing and a bit of self-denial, I convinced myself I hadn't seen what I thought I had, that it was just a really vivid daydream. That seemed to work, and I went back to living my life, though I entered that room with a bit more caution for the next few days. Eventually, I forgot about it. Then two weeks later, I saw a massive, floating, swirling orange ball in my bathroom. I almost wet myself again. I stood there, gaping at it, this weird, spinning, levitating globe that was bigger than a beach ball, hanging mid-air over my tub. I stared at it for a full ten seconds with my mouth wide open, then squeezed my eyes shut, whispering to myself, that ain't real. That ain't real. After about five seconds, I opened my eyes again. It wasn't there. Ever had a moment where you doubted your own sanity? Wondered if what you saw was real or if your mind was messing with you? Honestly, when I think about it, the idea of losing my sanity was way scarier than losing my vision. I've battled through tough times and always took pride in being not just a survivor, but someone who's living life. How could I keep that up if I went nuts? That night, I barely slept, and I stayed on edge for days. Any hint of movement or an unfamiliar shape would make my heart race, and I'd question if it was even real. It was the roughest period I'd ever faced, even worse than when I got the diabetes diagnosis. 
When Dr. Harper told me about diabetes, at least I got a clear prognosis. It was a physical condition, had a name, and most importantly, there was a treatment plan. This was something else. My own mind had betrayed me, my senses and my grip on reality had gone haywire. It's only when you're in that spot that you truly grasp how terrifying it is. Your senses and how your brain makes sense of them are your only real defense against danger. You sense trouble and avoid it, keeping yourself safe. But what happens when you can't trust your senses to warn you about real dangers? Lois was the first to notice, picking up on my skittish behavior. She asked what was up, if I needed to talk, but I just said I was fine, except for the terrible sleep. That last part was true. I couldn't sleep at all. Just the thought of being stuck in some institution, spending my days as a drugged-up zombie in a white room with the echoing cries of fellow patients for company, terrified me beyond belief. But what was the alternative? Live recklessly and put myself and others at risk? In the end, I chose to ignore it. I figured if I could function around people without them realizing what was happening, that was good enough. A whole month passed before the next incident, and for a while, I thought maybe I'd put this whole mess behind me. With each passing day, my confidence grew. So on that Wednesday morning, I stepped onto the sunny street feeling pretty carefree. Every Wednesday, I treated myself to a latte at Joe's, the same coffee shop Lois and I used to visit. It was a little tradition that brought me a lot of joy and helped me make friends with regulars and the staff, including Joe himself. As I strolled down the street with my white cane, I took in the colors and shapes around me. I enjoyed the sun on my face and the birds singing. It was a good day. Then I saw them, a group of pilgrims, six of them, all decked out in settler-era outfits, sitting on the pavement. They weren't looking at me. Instead, they were deep in a heated, yet strangely quiet argument. I froze, staring at them. They kept on arguing, making wild gestures, but I couldn't hear a thing, even though by the looks of it, from their anger, they should have been screaming at each other. I stood there, shocked, and my white cane slipped from my numb fingers, clattering onto the sidewalk. I turned to leave, desperate to escape the eerie sight of these colonists on the road, but I was so frantic, so hurried, that I accidentally stepped on my cane. It rolled underfoot, and before I knew it, I fell hard, crashing to the ground. I didn't manage to break my fall in time, and I banged my cheek and scraped my palms. A passerby, a kind woman, cried out and rushed over to help. She knelt by my side, offered a tissue for my bleeding cheek, and insisted on driving me to Dr. Harper's to check out my injuries. Looking back, I'm pretty sure she could tell my distress had nothing to do with the fall. At the time, I felt embarrassed and annoyed, but now I realize I owe her a debt of gratitude. Without her stepping in, who knows how long I would have endured before breaking down from the sheer stress and ending up in an asylum. Andrew, why don't you tell me what happened? Dr. Harper asked, gently treating my cheek with disinfectant. I told him it was just a balance slip, no big deal. But I think he saw through my weak excuses to the deeper unease. He didn't push, didn't force the issue, he just asked what might have caused the clumsiness. Then he inquired about how I'd been lately. When I mumbled my way through the vaguest answer I could muster, he placed a comforting hand on my shoulder. Andrew, he said gently, why don't you tell me what happened? I broke down in tears. I confessed how scared I was, how I'd fought so hard for my independence, and now it felt like it was slipping away. He listened patiently and then asked me why I ever thought that. I paused, took a deep breath, and pondered. This was the point of no return. But honestly, what other choice did I have? With tears streaming down my face, I spilled my guts to Dr. Harper. 
I told him about the horse and carriage, the orange globe, and the pilgrims. I laid it all out, how I'd been living in constant fear, terrified that I was going insane. Dr. Carper took a moment to think. Then he said, Andrew, I don't believe you're losing your sanity. The relief I felt at that moment was so overwhelming that it left me speechless. You mentioned you've never heard any sounds from these visions, nor have you experienced any other physical sensations like touch or smell, right? He asked. I shook my head in agreement, and he patted my shoulder again. Andrew, have you ever heard of Charles Bonnet syndrome? He inquired. Charles Bonnet? Who? I responded, bewildered by this unexpected change in our conversation. All right, let me break it down for you, Dr. Harper said gently. Charles Bonnet was a Swiss naturalist from the 1700s. He discovered a peculiar condition in his elderly grandfather, who was nearly blind due to cataracts. The old man used to have visual hallucinations, seeing random patterns, people, and places. Sound familiar? Yes, I replied, still puzzled. Am, am I going crazy? No, Andrew, not at all, Dr. Harper reassured me. Do you understand how perception works? In simple terms, your eyes take in light, process it through the iris, pupil, and retina, turning it into electrical signals decoded by the brain. The brain then organizes these signals into a recognizable image. Follow me? I nodded, finally starting to grasp it. When the retina gets damaged, like in cases of macular degeneration, those signals get all distorted, Dr. Harper continued. But your brain still receives them and does its job, translating these jumbled signals into an image. Sometimes it fills in the gaps with colors, patterns, creatures, or places that aren't actually there. And that's what we call Charles Bonnet syndrome. I nearly cried with relief. So I'm not losing my mind, I exclaimed. Not at all, the doctor replied. This is purely a physical condition. Your mind is working perfectly fine. If you had any mental illness, your delusions would affect more than just your sight. You'd hear them, smell them, even feel them. This is solely related to your eyes, not your brain. Leaving Dr. Harper's office, I felt like a weight had been lifted off my shoulders. My vision was still an issue, but knowing it was an eye problem, not a mental one, made it manageable. I was ready to face the world once more. Since then, I've seen plenty of bizarre visions. I witnessed a massive waterfall in the park, complete with mist and butterflies fluttering about. I spotted a Native American warrior, sporting a feather headdress, seated at the coffee shop counter. I beheld an intricate, seemingly impossible scaffolding structure crisscrossing the entire front of my apartment building. Heck, on the 4th of July last year, I even saw a majestic green dragon soaring through the sky, twisting and turning overhead. All these visions looked entirely real, yet now that I knew they were mere tricks of the eye, they no longer bothered me. In fact, I grew to enjoy them, seeing them as unique and entertaining little spectacles or artworks meant solely for my amusement and no one else's. I started to embrace them. Then, a month ago, I saw her. It was nighttime, always is when I see her, and I was getting ready for bed. I walked into the kitchen for a glass of water and was startled to find a figure in the corner. She was tall, taller than any woman I'd ever seen, even though she stood hunched, still having at least six inches on me. While I was used to seeing characters in peculiar outfits, this was different. It didn't seem like a tire from any specific time. Instead, it was a strange mishmash of elements. She wore a sleek black tuxedo jacket, tailored to fit a woman's curves, over a worn-out, ruffled dress shirt. Completing the ensemble was a vibrant red body. On her hands, extended to each side, as if shrugging or perhaps testing the air, 
she wore soiled white gloves. Her fingers were unusually long, almost spidery, and occasionally they twitched, as if longing to grasp something. Her lower half sported crimson shorts, covering opaque black stockings. Her legs were long and graceful, frankly, attractive, the legs of a dancer. To complete the look, she had red heels, the same shade as her shorts and bounty, but they sparkled and shone, bringing to mind Judy Garland's ruby slippers from The Wizard of Oz. No matter how bizarre this whole getup was, I couldn't pry my gaze from her face. Most of it hid beneath a tilted and twisted bowler hat, concealing her eyes and nose. But below that hat's brim, I could see her deathly pale skin and a grin that sent chills down my spine. It was unnaturally wide, with far too many teeth. A smile supposed to radiate warmth, feel inviting and kind. But this woman's expression oozed malice, like the kind of glee you'd expect from a snake cornering a rat. But what really threw me off was the fact that she had a third arm sprouting from her back, curled up and over her head like a scorpion's tail. It was longer than any arm should be, and the hand on it had only three fingers, resembling a claw. It pointed right at me, and as I gasped in dismay and stumbled sideways, it seemed to follow my every move. For a few moments, I just stood there, completely flummoxed by the freakish figure in, in my kitchen. And she, in return, stood in the corner, grinning back. Finally, I came to terms with the fact that this was just another product of my hallucinations. I breathed a sigh of relief, realizing that to make this image vanish, all I had to do was shut my eyes. I'll be honest here, when I counted to five, I hesitated a bit before reopening my eyes. If I had and she'd still been there, grinning that wicked grin at me, I think I might have had a heart attack. But she wasn't there, and I let out another long sigh of relief, grabbed my glass of water, and returned to bed. The tall woman lingered in my thoughts in the days that followed. She was different from the other visions I'd had. Somehow, she felt more tangible. My buddy Jason picked up on my unease when we met for lunch that Friday. Jason was one of those friends I'd tried to push away shortly after losing my vision, but he refused to give up on me staying in touch week after week. Good friends are hard to come by, but great friends, those who stick by you for life, are even rarer. Jason, bless his kind heart, belonged to the latter category. You've got to spill the beans, dude, he said, as we sat down with our pizza. What do you mean? I'd replied, trying to play it down. You're so distracted, it's like you're searching for something in here all the time. You've eaten one slice of pizza in the time it took me to devour four. So I'll ask again, what's eating you? Jason said, waving a pizza slice for emphasis. It's nothing, I replied, feeling a bit silly. I just had a hallucination a couple of nights ago that really rattled me. I thought you were cool with those by now, he asked setting the pizza slice down. Yeah, I was. I mean, I am, but this one was different, I admit it. She scared the living daylights out of me. She? Jason raised an intrigued eyebrow. Tell me more. So, I spilled the beans, describing the tall woman and how she appeared to me. I explained that unlike my other hallucinations, she felt more real and she was the first to feature such a bizarre and unsettling mutation. Sure, I'd seen miniature versions of people before, referred to as Lilliputian by medical prose, but the extra appendage and her grotesque face were something entirely new. It was the combination of these factors, along with her unsettling posture, that disturbed me the most. So, Jason said after I'd finished, you're saying she had killer legs? Cut it out, you jerk. I laughed, tossing my napkin at him. No, seriously, I get it, man, Jason replied, passing the napkin back to me. If I walked into a room and saw a giant mutant, 
it'd scare the hell out of me too. But you know what's causing these visions? It's like the coachman and that waterfall you saw. It's a condition you're aware of, and you know how to handle it, okay. I know, I know, I replied. Thanks, man, you're right. I did feel better, so I flashed him a smile, took a big bite of my pizza, and changed the subject, asking about his crazy ex, a topic he was more than willing to dive into. The next time I saw the tall woman, just under a week later, I was in the middle of brushing my teeth. I stood at the sink, brushing away, when I spotted a figure in the mirror. She was out in the dimly lit hallway, peeking around the door behind me. That same sinister grin I'd seen before stretched her narrow face into a twisted grimace, the dirty bowler hat covering her eyes once again. As crazy as it sounds, it felt like she was trying to stay hidden. I yelped, spewing toothpaste foam all over the mirror, my toothbrush clattering into the sink. I spun around, my heart pounding, my breathing erratic. But she wasn't there. The doorway stood empty. I moved forward cautiously, taking small steps, attempting to peer around the doorframe into the hallway without exposing myself fully to its dim interior. The seconds ticked away as I inched closer and closer. I couldn't spot anything, so eventually, with a quiet affirmation, I ventured out of the bathroom. The hallway lay vacant, just like the rest of my apartment. I was rattled once more. This marked the first instance of witnessing a hallucination in a reflection, and I wasn't even certain if I had truly seen it. As I sit here, penning these words, aware of what would follow, I reckon I held that perspective as a defense mechanism, a way to shield myself from the harsh reality. I acted like a fool. A full two weeks passed without any incident. Sure, I caught a glimpse of a burst of color one day, a dancing yellow lightning bolt zigzagging down the street outside my apartment, but that was exactly the kind of occurrence I'd come to expect from my condition. It was thrilling otherworldly, but it didn't induce fear, not like she did. In hindsight, those two weeks were pure bliss. They served as a reminder of what life could be, the existence I'd carved out for myself since my diagnosis. Life was good. The night that transformed my perception of the tall woman, which happened last night, I had been out and had a couple of drinks. I met up with the other guys who had visual impairments for dinner, and we ended up at a bar afterward. I wasn't sloshed, but we collectively downed a fair amount of beer, and by the time I stepped into the refreshing night air, I felt pleasantly lightheaded. It took me a while to reach home, laughing and chatting with a couple of the guys from our group as we strolled along. It had been a fantastic evening. It's probably the last truly great one I'll ever have. I bade my friends good night and, fumbling with my key, let myself into my apartment. With unsteady steps, I walked into my hallway, closing the door a bit too loudly behind me. I removed my jacket and hung it on the hook by the door, then flicked the light switch. She was waiting at the far end of the hallway, all three arms raised in claw-like gestures, reaching toward me that same infuriatingly malevolent grin etched onto her pale countenance. I cursed again, louder than before, involuntarily stepping back, recoiling from the impossibly tall and horrifying figure lurking in my own home. The tall woman remained stationary, just standing there, gazing at me with that unsettling smile. I stared back, but there was no way I'd return the grin, Jesus Christ, I muttered quietly. You know that slightly paranoid feeling you sometimes get after a few drinks? That vague sense of post-alcohol unease. Picture that combined with a colossal grinning mutant woman suddenly materializing in your home. Let's just say it was extremely, incredibly, and seriously uncool. I can't deal with this, I sighed and closed my eyes. One, two, three, four, 
Five. When I opened my eyes, her face was mere inches from mine, grinning wider than ever. She had dashed the entire length of the hallway and was now so close that her long, grasping arms framed me, her fingers twitching and clawing at the air around my face. I could see her chest rising and falling as if she were silently mocking my attempts to dismiss her, as if she found it amusing that I thought I could ever escape her. I screamed a full-throated shriek of terror and actually dropped to my knees, instinctively shielding my head as if anticipating a blow. But it never came. Finally, I lowered my hands, gasping for breath, trembling. The hallway was empty, the tall woman nowhere in sight. I remained there on my knees for a moment, catching my breath. Then I leaped to my feet, turned, and bolted out of the apartment, out of the building, and onto the street. I stood there, shivering, utterly terrified, with no idea of what to do next. At last, I pulled out my phone and made a call. Hey, Andy, what's going on? Jason asked. Jason, I need you to come over, I said, tears streaming down my face. Jason didn't inquire why or complain. Instead, he simply replied, I'm on my way. In under twenty minutes, his car rolled up outside, and he hurried over to the steps of my building where I sat, shivering. He draped his jacket over my shoulders and inquired about what had happened, his voice filled with genuine concern. She's in there, I stammered. The tall woman. She's returned. All right, all right, he said, gently assisting me to my feet. Come on, buddy, let's go inside and investigate. I wish I could claim that I displayed bravery when we entered, but I'd be lying. I cowered behind Jason, one hand gripping his shoulder as we traversed my apartment. Of course, we found nothing. We're talking about a colossal mutant woman in a cramped one-bedroom apartment. Where on earth could she hide? Finally, after thoroughly checking every room twice, I had to concede that she had vanished. I'm really sorry, man, I apologized, feeling genuinely foolish. I got scared, and I'm sorry, man. Hey, forget about it, pal, Jason reassured me. So I'm here now. Where do you keep your liquor? After consuming half a bottle of bourbon, we both became quite chatty. She's, you know, just kind of unique, you know. I attempted to explain. I understand, I understand, he responded. It's like you saw something unsettling, and you feel unsettled, and that's unsettling. He didn't quite grasp it. No, she's different, you know. I elaborated. I've never experienced a recurring hallucination before. And they've never been frightening, you know. She's not like the others. Dude, Jason remarked, taking another sip of bourbon, you've got, like, Charlie Boney syndrome, and you know it makes you see stuff. So, he waved his hands in the air like a magician who had just performed a trick. I know, I know, I replied. No, listen, Andy, he said. You know it makes you see stuff. It's just your eyes, yeah. You didn't hear anything. You didn't feel anything. That's how it works. It's your eyes, and I know it's scary, man. But you've been through, like, hell and high water in your life so far. You're tough. One of the toughest, bravest guys I know. And you can handle some eerie hallucination chick. I chuckled unable to resist. She is a VRI eerie hallucination chick, though, dude. He laughed, too, and we both took a drink. You know, that might help, he said eventually, his voice contemplative. What, drinking? I asked. No? Well, guess it does, he chuckled. I mean, like, demystifying her. You should give her a name. Something ridiculous, so she's not scary. I have to admit, as much as I like creepy hallucination chick, it's a bit of a mouthful, I laughed. 
Yeah, I get that, he responded. Suddenly, something he'd mentioned earlier crossed my mind. How about Helen? I suggested. Helen Highwater? Awesome, he said, then raised his glass. Here's to Helen, buddy. To Helen, I smiled and emptied my glass. Jason crashed on my couch that night, primarily because he'd had too much to drink to even contemplate getting behind the wheel of a car. Honestly, though, I think he imbibed so much to have a reason to stay and watch over me. I'm glad he did. Knowing he was there made me feel safer, and I managed to get some sleep. Having the assurance that if the peculiar vision I had just named Helen were to reappear, I could rely on him for support. This morning, we both required some backup. Feels like a mule gave me a headshot. He groaned as I entered the living room. Yep, I replied, my own head pounding. Joe's? Joe's, he affirmed and struggled to get up. While sipping robust black coffee and munching on muffins, we kept the conversation to a minimum. Finally, Jason broke the silence. So, you cool now? He asked, muffin still filling his mouth. I nodded. Yeah, I think so. Not still bugged about you know who? He inquired. Helen? I responded with a grin. No, I genuinely don't think so. I reckon I can handle some eerie hallucination chick. Good, he chuckled, patting me on the back. That's cool, man. I bet you can. Now, as I sit here, crouched in my bathroom, too terrified to venture into my apartment, I know we were both mistaken. About everything. Remember when I told you earlier that the idea of being institutionalized, the very thought of losing my grip on reality, was the most terrifying thing I could imagine. Now I'd welcome that because the alternative is far, far worse. After breakfast, I bid farewell to Jason, and he hopped into his car and drove away. The day went by without any unusual occurrences, and when Lois dropped by this afternoon, she even commented on how cheerful I seemed. You got a lady in your life? She asked casually. I chuckled at that, wondering what she'd think if she knew the truth. Yeah, I laughed, something like that. Good for you she said with a sniff. You make sure you treat her right. That amused me even more, and I had to bite my lip. Sure, I replied. I'll do my best. Tonight, still a bit worn out from the events of the previous evening, I decided to turn in early. I brushed my teeth, washed my hands and face, and changed into my pajamas. Finally, I fetched a glass of water and headed into my bedroom. I slipped into bed and immediately felt incredibly relaxed. Within moments, I was on the verge of falling asleep, that sudden overwhelming drowsiness that sets in when you've spent the entire day resisting sleep. I decided that resistance was futile and sat up to switch off the light. I almost missed her, but as I reached for the switch, I caught a glimpse of something in my peripheral vision. My heart jumped into my throat as I turned toward the foot of my bed. The tall woman was hunched there, her grinning face staring at me from just beyond my feet. So many teeth. Her long, slender fingers spread out over my blankets, pushing slightly as she clutched the end of the bed. Slowly, agonizingly, her third deformed arm came into view over her shoulder, joining her other hands on my bedding. I froze, utterly paralyzed. I had reached a pivotal moment, arriving at a crossroads that had been approaching for some time. She observed me, grinning, as if she were waiting to see what I'd do, cruel amusement flickering across her pale face. But this time, I'd had enough. You don't scare me anymore, I declared, my voice filled with defiance and anger. I won't let you do this to me. I reached for the light switch. Good night, Helen, I declared triumphantly, then flipped it, plunging the room into darkness. I lay there, a profound sense of pride surging through me, 
grinning to myself in my warm, cozy bed, elated by the emotional triumph of conquering my own fear. And then it occurred. The very thing that led me to this moment, something that turned my blood to ice water and my bowls to jelly. Good night, Andrew, her raspy voice hissed from the darkness. You know, some of the folks who walk around us, they ain't real humans, born the regular way. They don't need as much air, grub, water, or sleep, but they can hustle twice as far and twice as quick as you. Most American and European doctors and undertakers couldn't tell they ain't regular humans just by looking at them. All they see is a body that could win Olympic medals without even trying, plus a brain that puts them at the top of whatever game they choose to play. The mimics ain't machines, aliens, or demons in human skin. They're their own type of life, been around on this planet way longer than us humans. These mimics, they've been imitating regular critters on Earth for over 500 million years. Some scientists even think as much as a quarter of all them old fossils are mimic fossils. Then fossils look almost exactly like regular dinosaurs, plants, and sea creatures, except the mimic bones always got these tiny organisms inside them. Without special checks, these organisms seem like simple impurities, but in our lab, we found these henicolomorpha in the bones of even living creatures. We figure a bunch of these tiny critters, no proper digestive system and all, live inside every mimic, calling the shots. These critters gather in all sorts of places, even on toe bones, pelvises, and skulls. In the world of science, there's only three fossils, one mummy, and one preserved baby mimic that hint at the existence of such creatures. These henicolomorpha work together inside the host to produce a little egg, about eight grams heavy, looks like a plain white pill. The egg's tough, can handle friction, pressure, heat, and stress, but it stops growing when it's around pure ethanol. We found that these henicolomorpha use the host to make the egg in some canal in the body. The mimic puts that egg in a quiet pool or bathtub. That egg blows up hundreds of times its size in three days, creating a full-grown human inside a special sack. Usually, the mimic don't look nothing like the parent. After the baby breaks free, the mimics go their own ways. We think it's a survival thing, so there ain't more than one mimic at risk at a time. I've been real fortunate to study these mimics in a controlled setup. My lab's got mimics of people, cats, dogs, crows, octopuses, even a tree frog, a horse, and an elephant. Every single one of them, even that frog, drops the exact same eight-gram egg into some still water, and they guard it like it's second nature. After three days, the critters they produce usually become the cream of the crop in their own fields, the smartest crows, the fastest bugs and some mighty interest in humans. Testing for them, Senecolomorpha ain't common or practical right now. The only sure way to spot a mimic is by checking the bones after they've passed. Our methods for figuring out if they're mimics while they're still kicking have an 85% success rate, and we've locked up four folks we suspected were these fake humans. So we got this first prisoner, we call him one. He used to be a high-flying financial big shot, racking in 78 million bucks a year before we nabbed him. Then there's two, this tall drink of water with raven hair, and she's a real bruiser, busted up three of our security crew's ankles and elbows. She's running the biggest brothel in Bucharest. Number three, he's the big boss of the third largest home security outfit in America, but he's also one of the nastiest serial killers ever. Our outbound team cleaned up his place, and they said it was like finding another gate to hell. The last one, she's an artist and a housewife, never did anything worth a footnote in her 43 years on this planet. We had our doubts, thought maybe she fell into that 15% margin of error. Now, not all these mimics are playing ball with us. One of them starts yelling for a lawyer soon as he lays eyes on any of us, 
and that's all he says. Two, she just turns her back when we stroll by, won't give us the time of day. But she talks to the others, spills nothing about what's going on with the mimics. That housewife, she's dead set on being a regular human, won't even look at the test results. But the killer, he's the only one who listens. I was the bearer of bad news. You could see it sinking in on his face, slow and steady. Then he's on his knees, crying tears of joy, thanking me for giving him the reason why he's different. Our orders are to keep these mimics locked up forever. They spend every hour in solitary but naked, at a steady 73 degrees. Their cells are these waterproof, padded, light gray cubes with showers built into the wall, water gets scanned and all that. Got a fancy sensor bite it to stop them from offing themselves in the shower. No beds, no blankets, no pillows, just comfy surfaces to sleep on, like the fancy private prisons want. They get a single 90-watt natural sunlight bulb and a touchscreen terminal with restricted internet, only for entertainment, nothing else. Two meals a day and this foamy toothbrush tablet. All that just so we can keep a real close eye on him, watching their every move, waiting for that moment when they pop out an egg. We lost a few to madness and one to suicide before they told us to give him a way out. We came up with this story, told them we only cared about studying their eggs and larvae, not them. If they could pop out an egg for us to poke at, they'd be free, no strings attached, just keep quiet. We'd move them to a different part of the lab, and they'd never see the outside world again. Number two already had an egg tucked away in her hair, slipped it out while she was pretending to sleep. She handed it over, got herself transferred, and now she's in the dressing room. We got footage of one, caught him hacking and spitting, trying to stash that egg. His hiding spot wasn't exactly original, you know. He tried to pass it off as dehydrated flame, said we ain't real doctors. But we knew it was an egg. Sent him packing to the private shower, and he didn't seem too upset about it. Then there's the housewife, who dropped an egg in her excrement, and one of our staff had to dig it out with a glove up to the elbow. She ain't buying it, but she didn't put up a fight when we moved her to the personal items collection booth. That just left us with the killer, the last mimic stand-in for a couple of weeks. Man, he was pushing hard, trying to squeeze out an egg in every way possible. Then a few days back, he started bawling for two hours, then letting out a scream, and then it all stopped. Suddenly, he's crying tears of joy, holding up an egg that popped out through his tear duct. His relief and happiness were like a waterfall, I'm telling ya. He was acting like he'd been crowned king of the world. Swore off killing, said it wasn't really his will that made him do it, it was just his mimic nature. I believed him, as only someone with enlightened eyes shines like he did. He danced his way to the waiting room. Them rooms, they look like what they're supposed to be, but them vents hide powerful suction machines. After about twenty seconds of agony and squirming, they pass out for good. Bodies get ground up and burned, all hush-hush like our bosses want. And they want more. We're keeping up with the times, developing new ways to spot these mimics. A bunch of agencies worldwide are hunting them down too, in a year, we'll have the tech to detect him with 97% accuracy within a 15-mile radius. They paid us triple oat and weekly bonuses to spot him using electromagnetic pulses. I took that dirty money and bought a big estate upstate with a comfy bed for my wife and kids. I was raking it in, trying to rid the world of what I thought was an ancient curse among us, not knowing what they truly were or their significance. I didn't care about that, it was all about the cash and success. This paradise kept going till one Saturday morning, where the last sip of the night before didn't agree with me. I was brushing my teeth, and up came an egg, plopping right into a puddle of vomit and foam in my bathroom sink. 